Welcome to the Inspired Evolution. And it is such a treat to be here today. We have with us Jonathan Levy. How are you, brother? Fantastic, man. How are you? Really good. Really blessed to have you here. For those tuning into Jonathan for the first time, he's an experienced entrepreneur, angel investor, and life hacker from Silicon Valley. He's known for speed learning his way through all of his achievements in life, which I can't wait to dive into, brother. It is such a pleasure. There is such a range of things going on in there, from entrepreneurship to podcasting and even dating. Since 2014, He's been one of the top performing instructors on Udemy with his course, Become a Super Learner, which we'll dive deep into some of the stuff around that, which is now actually retired, has earned him over 60,000 students. He's since snowballed this success into the launch of his own brand and platform called the Superhuman Academy, which produces podcast uh, products such as the award-winning Superhuman Academy podcast. Um, and there's numerous online courses, which, yeah, let's get into some of the meats and bones of that. He's based in Tel Aviv in Israel, which I personally love. We can dive into that a little bit. And uh, recently released his third book, The Only Skill That Matters, which is a deep for, for like philosophical sort of statement, which I really can't wait to peel apart as well. So there's a lot of good stuff going on here. Welcome, brother. Thanks for having me, man. I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> so how is it in Tel Aviv? How is it in Israel at the moment? Ah, oh, it's great. I'm really happy to be back. I took uh, I took three weeks off for my honeymoon and then I've been... Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I traveled the week before and the week after. So I'm just happy to be here, even though it's like hot as all hell <laughs> in the middle of October, but I'm happy to be here. But you do have good beaches, so you can't we really complain. You can't really complain. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> Where'd you totally. go for your honeymoon, brother? <laughs> we went to Korea and Japan. We did the ah. whole Japanese tour and then we were in Seoul for a little bit. It was awesome. It was awesome. Really fun. Yeah, nice. I, uh, yeah, we, I'm getting married in January, so the honeymoon is in Brazil. And so, thank you. Thank you. It's like, yeah, Beautiful. it's uh, must be in the air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's that final personal development uh, step where you develop yourself into a we instead of a me. <laughs> yeah. And then, oh, well, that continues, right? Apparently kids, uh, I can only imagine what that's going to teach myself yourself yeah. like it just even just that trends like i know like the wedding is this whole thing like you have to organize but i've just been thinking a lot in the lead up to it as well like actually i'm gonna be a father you know like that that transpires a whole nother layer of yeah you, definitely talking about, about learning all day yeah. <laughs> I think about this all the time because you know you, you followed my stuff I, I like to hack things i like to do you know do get better results and 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 exceed what is possible and yeah that's like the ultimate frontier right of, of figuring out so i spend a lot of time thinking about it talking to my wife about it like how how can we how can we hack this process and be awesome kick-ass parents especially given my passion about learning and how much i struggled as a child learning, I want to make sure like, because you, you can't just download your experience to another human being. So how do you frame it in such a way that they're ready and willing to learn it from you? Mm. And, uh, I, I think I'm ready for the challenge. The beautiful thing is I've realized nature gives you 10 months, not every gestation <laughs> period of every, of every animal in the animal kingdom is 10 months, right? But you get 10 months. Most people don't realize 40 weeks yeah. is a normal term pregnancy. So 10 months to prepare from the day you find out you're going to be a father. <laughs> Long, that's a long time in accelerated learning land. But so. just to demonstrate that I've been thinking about it just as much as you have, they do come out premature <laughs> even after that they time do. because the, and then do. they're susceptible to like being in the womb, but that womb frequency right. is still being in that Delta, uh, that Delta wave state, but they're out in hypnosis land, but in the world taking everything on like a sponge. It's not wild. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Right. They come out early and, uh, and we, we'd planned everything. We had a, uh, someone go on mat leave, uh, on our team and we were all ready, geared up. They became two weeks early. Yeah. Ready. Yeah. I'm sure she wasn't ready, but we as a team were not ready either. So we're still catching up. So uh, to just to bring this, throttling this into a bit of a conversation, yes. uh, your TEDx talk was on education and the system being a little bit broken. Um, actually, mm -hmm. it starts off with, yeah, it's a little bit broken. And then this is a little bit broken. And then that's a little bit broken. Actually, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's very, very broken. Right. I think the thing that attracts me to you the most, um, obviously the podcast is called The Inspired Evolution. Um, you, if I'm direct, I'm almost directly quoting you when I say this, I think we use, you're using the brain the way evolution intended versus yes. the education system, um, which teaches us to learn. So there's like these two things, which you literally put them in juxtaposition. I'd love to like find out more about that 
Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm really passionate about, I, I spend a lot of time thinking about like, what is my body engineered for? Because if you, if you're into life hacking and you're into nutrition, you're into mm -hmm. fitness as much as I do, you eventually hit up against the point. There's, there's two ways to handle it, right? There's mm -hmm. one way, which is the way that I kind of take is like millions of years of evolution, then thousands of years of dramatic technological change. Things like reading, like we invented writing 15,000 years ago. It wasn't popularized. The average person couldn't read till a thousand years ago. That's nothing on an evolutionary time scale. We separated from other primates 7 million years ago and yeah. we became this format one and a half to 2 million years ago. So what's a thousand years? Mm. And so I, I spent a lot of time thinking about like, this hardware that I have, which is a miracle and a blessing, but it's outdated for the world that I'm living in. How do I come into alignment? Which is why I'm a big fan of the paleo diet, which is why I'm a big fan of functional fitness, you know, because people were lifting stuff over their head a million years ago. People were mm -hmm. squatting down and picking up heavy stuff a million years ago. I don't know if they were doing bicep curls. <laughs> You know, so I'm, I'm really passionate about that. And, and I've been deeply influenced by people like Rob Wolf and Lauren Cordain, who've done the research, who've done the work. Um, and you've all know Harari who've, who've explained like, this is how we evolved. Yeah. Um, and I came to this realization after teaching these techniques for a couple of years that all I was doing was teaching kind of paleo learning really mm, because paleo I, learning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to take you back and I want you to imagine this is actually almost direct quote from my book, but I want you to go back a million years ago, pretend you're roaming the savannah, right? You're mm. a, a paleolithic man or woman. Yeah. If you're a man, you're a great hunter gatherer. If you're a woman, or I'm sorry, you're a great uh, hunter. If you're a man, potentially, I'm sure there were, you know, people who broke gender roles, but if you're a woman, you're a gatherer. Either way, you know, thousands of plant species, you know, your mm -hmm. way back to the watering hole, you know how to navigate using the stars, mm -hmm. you know, which direction you're facing, you know, which animals in which seasons, which plants are medicinal, you know, so much information, Yeah, totally. but you don't know how to read. You don't know, <laughs> you know, the oral history and tradition of your tribe dating hundreds of years back. Uh -huh. You have all this memory and knowledge, but you don't know how to read mm -hmm. and, and the reason I, I kind of take people back to that moment is, is realizing our brains are evolved to store huge amounts of information, massive. And we still know this from the few remaining tribal peoples that there are out there yeah. in places like New Guinea. I mean, they have so much knowledge, but it's not in books mm. and it's, it's not rote memorization. It's very exper experiential, visual, sensory information. And so what we do is we teach people how to tap into that with things like visual mnemonics, right? How do we turn the things that we're learning? Because at some point our learning became more abstract, right? Yeah. How do I learn about DNA? It's something that I can't see. I mm -hmm. can't actually see genetics. So how do I turn that learning into a visual and sensory experience? And once you do that, you can do superhuman feats of memory. You use techniques like visual mnemonics, techniques like the memory palace. You can memorize literally anything be it 1500 people's names mm. all the way up to pi to 30,000 digits to all the bones and ligaments and tendons in the human body, whatever it is you need to learn, but you first need to fit it into that evolutionary blueprint of what does my brain actually respond to mm, and, what and is how it does it work? For? Yeah. Bingo. Yeah, bingo. Yeah. And, and the other thing is also there's the visual component and there's the connection component because our brains are 2% of our body's mass, they consume 20% of our body's resources. Hmm. In order to, to function, I mean, we're kind of like a weird, you ever heard someone say that bumblebees shouldn't actually be able to fly because of the dynamics of their weight to wing hmm. ratio? Well, human beings also, we're like this weird, freaky creature because <laughs> we walk on these, on these tiny little feet, which is a miracle that we're able to stand that we're bipedal. We have these huge brains yeah. Our brain to body weight ratio is the highest of any species. We don't have the biggest mm. brain by far, but mm. our brain to body weight ratio is by far the biggest. And everything, I mean, even what we were talking about, right? This gestation period of 10 weeks, the fact that uh, um, our social structures, everything is based around this brain. It's mm. crazy. We've evolved our entire social systems, the entire concept of maternity leave, the fact that we... Uh, uh, mate the way that we do, the fact mm -hmm. that we have pendulous breasts, it all has to do with the fact that we walk upright. Yeah. We walk upright to protect this massive brain. It's our only, we don't have claws, we don't have teeth, we don't have any of this other stuff. We have the brain. That's yeah. our defense mechanism. And so um, the way that our brains 
work is based on connection. And too, far too many times in our education, we're taught a new subject, whether that's Portuguese or that's uh, you know biomechanics, mm. and we treat it as a new subject. Mm. And our English teacher never connects to the stuff that our hi history teacher is teaching us. So our brain goes, you know, hey, I, I don't know very much about Portuguese, and so therefore this algorithm that I have, you have this part of the brain called the hippocampus. It goes, we don't have a lot of information about this. We've never needed Portuguese before. So why should we remember it? Mm. As opposed to learning something new and connecting it to existing neural networks and going, okay, this is Portuguese, but this might be relevant because it's very similar to this other thing that I know and tricking the brain into going, yeah, we should probably remember this. This seems important. Finding correlations between the pieces of information. Exactly. Exactly. And it makes a massive difference. It sounds like the silly little thing, but it makes a massive difference in your brain's ability, not just to find the information, mm. but to store it. Because mm. our brains, coincidentally enough, work a lot like Google's PageRank algorithm. Mm. Remember in the 90s, there were like other search engines and then Google <laughs> came out and nobody used it anymore because yeah. it was just better at finding the right information or mm. it works on the same principle as our brain. It asks, how many connections are there to this piece of information? and how valuable or strong or trusted are those connections and, and those resources that it's connected to. Your brain does the same thing. If, you, if I were to tell you a little known fact now about, mm. say, your mother, you have tons of memories about your mother, well, I would go, well, actually, did you know, Amrit, that she served on the board of this company long before you were born? Yeah. It's like, that's highly relevant information. Whereas if someone you just randomly met were, were to tell you, yeah, 20 years ago, I served on the board of this company. You'd forget In one it. Way and out the other. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and it's because of that. It's because your brain goes, whoa, this information is related to something that's really important to us. We have a lot of memories around mom and what mom was like. And so it connects mm. and, and you can do that. You can, you can, I don't want to say fake those connections, but you can fabricate those connections to anything that you learn because mm. all human knowledge is connected at the end of the day. And even if it's not, you can find new ways and unique ways of creating these connections as if. And, and that's one of the things that we teach people is when you learn something new, create those connections. We call it dual encoding. Yeah, right. That sounds quite a creative process. It could be like actually... It's very creative, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds yeah. amazing. And so I kind of yeah. know the other, the like, so I know connection, connecting information is obviously because I follow your work as well. Mm -hmm. So connecting information is really important. One thing I didn't realize was that actually 70% of people are visual. I would argue a hundred percent. I would argue <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a spectrum and the, the reason that some people think they aren't visual is mm. because they have it broken out of them. Our, our minds and our bodies are adaptation machines and we'll adapt to whatever it is that we're forced to do. Yep. So if you're sat in a classroom from age eight or mm. even seven, all the way up to age 24 and you're lectured at, mm. you are going to come away with, you're going to adapt and you're going to come away with the belief that I learn better auditorily. Right. But I would challenge that. I mean, we've had 200,000 people go through our course where we help them rediscover their visual memory. Mm. And all of a sudden, 100% of them are visual. Yeah. Um, and so on an evol evolutionary tool, you think that's because we had to, like, obviously we used to use the, t the we were olfactory, we used to taste as well. These yeah. senses are quite yeah. prevalent. But you think visual is, or from your understanding, visual is the most prominent in terms of helping us remember things not the most prominent, the most prominent useful one. So smell and taste yeah. are actually the same sense that we experience in two different ways, right? They are actually the most memorable and hardwired sense. They mm -hmm. predate the mammalian brain. So it's actually the reptilian brain. It's hardwired all the way in, which is why if someone is passed out, all the functions of their brain are out, off. But if you give them smelling salts, they'll wake up. So actually the reptilian brain is, is, uh, in charge of smell and that's a more memorable scent, believe it or not. You'll never forget the, the taste of mom's home cooking. Oh, totally. Take you back 40 years from now. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, we can't learn a whole lot. I mean, maybe if you're learning, uh, that's all the emotional, intelli all the emotional intelligence work. Don't discount that. <laughs> right. But it's very hard to read a book with your Absolutely. nose. So how do we experience all this like new learning? Uh, we use the second best thing, which yeah. is visualization. Brilliant. And, uh, and, and it's, it's first off, it's fast. I mean, mm. I can show you a picture and a picture is a thousand words in a, in a split second. So it's fast to understand pictures uh, and it's highly memorable.
Yeah, and that picture is a thousand words. We can touch on that in a little bit as well. Mm-hmm. But then the the next the next piece is I know you talk about um, something that really like sank in deep for me, and I didn't realize how much of this I already used in my own life. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was a massive affirmation when I was tuning into work is re- repetition. Um, I just had this piece of wisdom that was handed down to me. And I think it's an Indian, um, I don't want to call it a, yeah, it's just a piece of wisdom that's handed to, um, like they say repetition is the father of learning. Um, yep. and it's so true. Yeah, yeah. I just, and your work advocated it in such, and you were like, dude, this is like a key piece. And I was like, oh wow. I just, Huge. that was ingrained in me. And I've just been doing that. Like, for example, at the moment I'm learning a song um, and I'll, I'll legitimately just be practicing it like once in the morning, once at night as a bare minimum, you know, and I just know the more times I visit it, the less, um, the less friction there is between the next time I visit it and like having to recall like the chords, the, uh, the nuances, yep. the melody, the rhythm, all that sort of stuff. Bingo. Yeah. Repetition is huge. And, and I've interviewed at least 20 of the world's world record holders, memory games champions, and they all agree like... Uh, if you don't repeat, doesn't matter how good of a memorizer you are or nemonist is, is the mm. proper term, you have to repeat because of that same thing. Our, our brains thrive on this frequency as well as novelty and as well as connection. So um, we know from, from the work of a guy named Herman Ebbinghaus 150 some odd years ago uh, that there's this curve of forgetting, exponential mm. loss. The first time you learn something, it drops off almost immediately. Mm. Second time, a little bit longer. Third time, a little bit longer still. And you can push it out to the point where you'll never forget things. Mm. Almost. I mean, longer than your lifespan. <laughs> like, I'll forget the word uh, thank you probably in 200 years if I don't use it. Something like yeah. that, which I, we'll see. But I, I have <laughs> Hopefully. But um, in any case, so repetition is this huge thing. Um, and we don't do it enough in schools. Or if we do it, we do it wrong, right? Because you, you only need to review the things that you're at risk of forgetting. Hmm. And so there's these software systems called spaced repetition systems that you can input information hmm. and say, you know, this question was really hard. It'll give it, give it to you more frequently. Whereas that word, you, you know, when you're flipping through your flashcards, it's like, ah, oh, this one's easy. We'll pull it out, but don't pull it out forever. You need to bring hmm. it back a month later instead of a week later. And so that's it. That's a huge component as well of accelerated learning is cutting down that review time, but still doing the review. One of my, my issues, I think with the way most people learn is they think that it's, um, you know, it's like software updates. You just, you install the software and now great, I know Portuguese. But in fact, if, you know, if we actually wanted students to succeed and, and implement what they learned, why is there one final exam? By the way, testing is great. It's one of the best things that schools do. Testing is a phenomenal way to get the stakes real in learning. But like, you know, you get tested once on uh, AP US history and then you move on to the next thing and it mm. never comes up again in your education. There's no form of repetition once the semester is over. Straight to the data dump. It's a real shame. Yeah. It's a real shame because it just causes people to forget it right away. Mm. Yeah. And I, I realized, I didn't realize the hippocampus was, there was like two, I thought I was used to just understand that there was one part of it, but you called it the hippocampi. There's two parts to hippocampus. There's hippocampus. one in the left like, hemisphere and one in the right hemisphere. That is basically yeah. responsible for just eliminating the information that no longer serves you. It's responsible for a lot of stuff. It's it's uh, memory consolidation or lack thereof. But we're always discovering. You know, I'm not a neuroscientist, but uh, but we're always discovering. Like, oh wait a minute, we didn't we didn't know that that actually is involved in this. And <laughs> yeah, like, weird stuff starts to happen when you track people's brains. You're like, why is why is blood flowing there? But yeah, to the best of our current understanding, the hippocampus hippocampi are involved in memory consolidation. Amazing. So we've kind of floated through, like, can you summarize your like three key things for like to improve your memory? Cause we've kind yeah, of floated through so that. I would say I, the way I like to teach it is, is pictures, connections, and locations. We didn't get yep. to touch on locations too much, but because of that evolutionary, uh, design, if you will, um, we're really good at memorizing locations because locations are just visual stimuli. Mm. So, you know, you'll never forget the layout of your childhood home. It's always there. And nemonists at, at the highest levels and most elite levels hack this. And they actually store their memories in what's called a memory palace. Mm. So they create the pictures, the pictures are connected to their existing knowledge, and they store them, organize them in memory palaces. Mm. And then from there, if you want to continue to access that information, it's not for a memory competition that you're going to forget tomorrow, then repetition. 
repetition, 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 and, and spacing your repetition out in an intelligent way. So. so tell me a little bit more about this. So I know my episodes always end up being a bit more chop suey and maybe they're a bit more linear on your show, uh-huh. but, <laughs> but, um, yeah, so that's like, it's, there's a couple of questions that are emerging right at the same time for me. So I'll go with the first one that comes up for me is when we're talking mm-hmm. about super learning, why is it that mm-hmm. the conversation is generally around memory? and speed reading like why is it that we're trying to like take information it's it's all about information in and retention um is there other are there other parts to learning totally um such as like for me curiosity is a big thing you know as an intention to start with right um but we don't really talk about these things yeah i think it's a it's a classic case of uh sell people what they want and give them what they need Mm. and i realized early on because i was the target demographic people are really excited about speed reading right that's this big sexy thing when in fact speed reading is cool it's a powerful tool it'll save you time but it's i always say that speed reading is a tool memory and mnemonics are an operating system upgrade you know, it's, it's just changing the way that your brain works. And in fact, I've said that for years and years and years that your brain feels like it's working. If it goes from diesel to electric, Mm. uh, and then a study actually came out in neuron magazine, uh, that proved that actually training in these mnemonic techniques changes the way that people's brains are wired permanently. Mm. And I was like, that's what I've been saying. <laughs> now, we actually have, now we actually have proof. Um, so there's that element. And as I've, as I've gone deeper and deeper and done the work more and more, I've realized that there are additional components, right? So in, in this latest book that I wrote, The Only School That Matters, we go more into how do I prepare for learning? Like how do I prime mm. myself, get into the right mindset, which is a huge thing, right? You can have all the mnemonics in the world, but if you're not ready and willing and excited to learn, how do you do that? Hmm. We teach a skill called pre-reading as well, which is how do I pick up the most boring text possible <laughs> and get myself excited about reading it? Find a way to generate excitement, interest, and curiosity. That so could be a useful skill. skill. <laughs> it's really, really, it's like one of the hidden Easter eggs that I'm most passionate about in, <laughs> in the book. And, and, and there are many more components. How do you ask questions, right? Mm. Like there, there, the worst thing you can do is not ask questions because when you're learning from another human being, it's this magical experience. If you think about it, like you have an idea, thought or concept, which is just a a pattern of neurons arranged in a certain specific way. And you're trying to vibrate waves in the air and get me to replicate that exact pattern of neurons. But Uh what are the odds that I'm going to understand a concept in the exact same way that you understand it? And then they're going to ping and fire in the same relationship. Yeah. What are the odds? Yeah, totally. It's crazy. So, so we teach in our courses and programs, a lot of different skills around that. So one is how do I learn from many different sources? Because Mm. I'm, I'm depending on your ability to explain in my way of understanding, which is Mm. again, what are the odds? There's a million different ways to explain a concept like uh, friendship or whatever it may be, some abstract concept. Um, so learning from as many different sources as possible to complete and round out the way that you understand, we call that brute force learning, but also how do I ask questions in an intelligent way? And I'll give you guys, uh, I'll give your listeners a, a pro tip. Too many people ask open ended questions when they're trying to learn. So for example, they'll say something like, I don't understand. Can you explain that again? Well, what have I just done? I've just said, try and find another way to explain Mm -hmm. what I didn't understand the first time. And a a quick hack that you can make is close your questions out. So Mm -hmm. what you want to do is you want to verify your knowledge. Mm -hmm. So let's say you explained something to me. For example, you explained to me how you got into podcasting before we get recording. Mm -hmm. What I might say is instead of saying, okay, wait, I don't get it. Hit me with that again. I might say, okay, I'm read." What I understood is that you were in corporate and you wanted to find a different way out. So you started getting into podcasting, da, 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 da. Is that what you're saying? And the part that I didn't understand was, you know, were you struggling? Were you unhappy at that time? So I'm, I'm getting you to understand what's happening in my brain Mm. and then giving you exactly what I need Mm. and, or giving you the opportunity to go, no, 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 that, you know, because you can't see in my head. Yeah. But if I go, I understood this and you go, okay, wait, 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 that's where, that's where you're missing the piece. Mm-hmm. Actually, I was in nonprofits. So repeating out to you and, and kind of putting my neurons on display mm. gives you as the teacher, the opportunity to go, okay, here, I see where we have a problem. Yeah. 
Yeah. Which is an amazing uh, distillation. Like just for like, yeah, right. to when you summarize and then ask a question, like people can already pick that apart. I love that. And then exactly. also just having a yes or no, um, then someone can, and they don't feel as, um, I've been in situations before when people have asked open-ended questions and then it's like, okay, like for in some instances, and it's very important to get this, like no, neither is better than the other. They're both just right. effective in different, uh, different arenas. Like open-ended questions can right. be really useful. Um, but when you're trying to clarify something, it can be, it can, one person right. only really knows how to skin a cat so many ways. And then you're asking exactly. them again and again, it's like, wait, skin a cat, wait, skin a cat, wait, skin a cat. That's and it's exactly. like, <laughs> just explain the whole thing to you three times. <laughs> right. That's exactly, that's exactly. And the open-ended is really good for starting the inquiry. But as we start to get in and I'm really trying to learn from you, and I found this so powerful uh, when learning really complicated things, right? So uh, learning music theory and piano or learning Russian because there's, and I hear this a lot from parents, like you never know what's going on in someone else's head. You think the kid's crying because of this, but he's actually crying because I put my coffee cup down before giving him a hug and usually I hug him with the coffee, like weird shit. You never know what's happening in another human being's mind. So I would start asking questions like, okay, let me see if I understand here. When you say, you know, the circle of fifths and what I think you're saying is that these fifths are different wavelengths apart from one another. Is that correct? And they're like, yeah, that's exact. Okay. Cause you wouldn't have, ex you know, they would just say these mm -hmm. notes are equally spaced apart. What is that on the keyboard? They're equally spaced <laughs> apart. They're equally spaced apart in timing or they're equally spaced apart in wavelength, you know? So, uh, and if I just said, what do you mean equally spaced apart? Well, they're the same distance from one another. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's like you never get to the actual misunderstanding Crux of it. Yeah, exactly. That. So that's a powerful tip for people to play with. Perfect. So one place I, there's still this conversation in the back of my head. I do want to have with you, but I'm going to just quickly take this perfect little segue. Dude, I'm in love with music. I'm really in love with music. I'm like super, super in love with music. I know you speak, uh, last time I, I researched you was like four languages. Is that what we're up to at the moment? We're doing four languages. I do, yeah. I've taken a real hiatus on Russian. <laughs> Russian almost broke me. A very hard language. But yeah. Yeah. How's, how's all the, the producing the <laughs> and the syllables? And the <laughs> oh, that's easy. The pronunciation is the easiest part. For oh, me. really? It's... Um, Russian is a, is a special language because it has, con uh, it has conjugation and declension. And it was the first language I'd ever encountered, even though German has declension. I don't speak German. I grew up around it. Uh, and I just, this concept of conjugation time, you know, like tenses, male, female, neuter. Okay, cool. I can, I can hack that. But then you throw in this declension thing and you're like, wait, there's how many ways to say I? It's like, um, yeah, min, yeah. Yeah, like why? I got to Russia. I, this story in the book. I got to Russia so excited. I'd memorized like a thousand words in Russia, Russian. And I look at uh, the advertisement on the train from Demodedovo Airport, and it was Citibank's advertisement. And it said, always with you, always for you. Except they use two different words for you. And I was like, why would you use two? And then it hit me like, oh my God, there's declension in this language. And I have no, so I, you know, I, I wasn't able to speak because mm. there's no articles, fun fact for people, there's no articles in uh, Russian. So I would never, I can't say I give the book to you. It's I give the book you and depending on which I and which you, you know, if you gave the book to me or I gave the book to you. Oh, that weird? that's a bit slippery. Yeah. Right. Okay. And also I could give you to the book. <laughs> It's like, it's like concept of me, concept of book, concept of you. And it could be either, you know, based on which word is, is pronounced which way. So it's hard. It, it's really hard. I, I thought I would learn Russian in like three months. So many political jokes just running through my head. Right now. Right. So the funny joke of like in Soviet Russia, car drives you. It's even funnier when you try to learn Russian. Because you're like, wow, if you don't pronounce it right, the car actually does actually drive, does drive you. you. I love that. Right. But yeah, flagging back music, like I feel like it's yeah. utilizing all the highest executive functions in your mind mm -hmm. and just bring that together in a symphony of just like neurons and just yeah. I, like I've, I've just been amazed at just my learning ability. I've been playing fun fact, my, I've got a hand pan. I've got two hand pans from Israel. One of the best hand pan makers cool. in the world lives in Israel. And, um, yeah, there's a whole story around that, which we can drop into, but, um, yeah, 
I'd learned from there. I ventured onto the guitar and just like taking on little bits and pieces, bits and pieces, and then putting it down, sleeping, coming back and things having dropped in. Like I've never really had such a, I guess I've never been so hyper aware of like a learning process, first of all. And second of all, just seeing how much a lack of sleep or an like extended amount of sleep can actually rebound into, wow, that's clicking in way better. Or actually I'm, Back where that I was. Wild? Dude, it's insane. It's insane. It's, I'm, wild. it's such a fun experiment. Some of the some of the most high performing individuals on the planet, like um, I think it was one of the Gracie brothers or one of one of the world's top uh, judokas used to immediately after a lesson, like after getting pummeled into the mat, used to just go under the bleachers and take a nap. And I'm blanking on his name, but it was for that. Uh, and Kirk Parsley told me he does the same thing. He's like, after I learn a lot, if I get my ass kicked in a match and I'm like, what were those moves? Take a nap immediately after to consolidate, which is, which is powerful. I love and, that. and by the way, music is a really special thing, right? Languages. Mm-hmm. I often like to say languages are the most challenging learning uh, project most people take on. Mm-hmm. Music is up there, if not higher. Here's a, here's a cool fun fact about music. There are animals in nature that can respond to melody like birds mm. and there are animals in nature that can respond to rhythm. Yep. Um, we're the only animal with a sophisticated enough brain to understand both at once yep. and bring that all together. Wow. And then you've got your motor skills and, and you're it. listening. Yeah. It's insane. It's, it's it, watching someone's brain on uh, music while producing music is crazy. Yeah. It's actually crazy that we can do it. And most people think, I mean, we're all impressed when we see someone on stage on stage playing piano, but just the fact that we can do that is yeah. mind blowing to me with, with my understanding of the brain. It's like, wow. Yeah. And even now I've been watching like even just society and I know you'll probably appreciate this, just watching people with their headphones on all the time, just watching like them just stimulating themselves into their own little audible bubble. And they're just kind right. of programming themselves to that frequency. And there's like, everybody's with their headphones in these days when you walk out onto the street, right. it's like, yeah, right. Like music is cognitively like it's so rewarding you can actually see that like we're actually almost wow. evolutioned to be here with music and yeah fascinates wow. me to the nth degree yeah and and learning music is so good for your brain yeah um there's early research on learning languages staving mm. off alzheimer's dementia it, yeah. it hasn't been proven but it's mm-hmm. it's one of those things and there's also early research uh you know who told me about this was um Andrew Weil, hmm. how doing things that involve dexterity. So, hmm. you know, those old ladies who, who knit or crochet and seem to live till 180, <laughs> there's a, there's something involved with that. That's actually keeping the brain active. And so music, which is combination of language, rhythm, dexterity, it's everything. Uh, I haven't, I haven't scanned the research in a couple of years about this, but I would not be surprised that they come out with like yeah, p- musicians are, have a lower risk of Alzheimer's or dementia. Mm, yeah. It wouldn't it. surprise me at all. I love it. And so in true chop suey fashion, just to show you how really chop suey can <laughs> get, obviously learning, um, you know, we're here, we're learning all this stuff about learning from you. And there are more than 60,000 people that have gone through your courses. And now I know your podcast, over 3 million people have like tuned in. I really want to tune into what was your story behind all of this? Yeah. Yeah, that's some good chop stewie. uh, (laughs) Because yeah, Yeah. I struggled. I struggled. Uh, I was a pretty happy kid, and I was always very different. Mm. uh, And I knew I was different, and I wasn't able to sit still in class, and I I wasn't able to learn as fast as other kids. My first memory of the classroom, I have memories of school playground. My first memory of the classroom was everyone else understood how to read the hands of a watch and I couldn't, and I had to stay back at recess. And the teacher was just like, you know, Jonathan, I'm, I'm not sure how else I can explain this. And I remember coming home to my mom and I was just like, I don't know. It was like, it seemed so basic. The other kids were getting it, but I just didn't understand. And I was lucky. I had really good teachers in elementary school who looked after me and I got tested quietly and my parents kind of knew what was going on. Uh, And it was all good and it was all cute until about sixth grade. And then it Mm. wasn't cute anymore. And all of a sudden school was hard and it was serious and it was no longer like what, you know, sitting still for a few hours between recesses. It was like all of a sudden grades mattered and Mm. we were actually getting grades, not little check marks. And And so I struggled. I went into a really deep depression, Mm. uh, self-hatred and 
it, it wasn't just the in-class learning that was mm. harming my self-esteem. It was the out-of-class learning. Mm. Other kids were learning how to talk to girls. They were learning how to play well on sports teams and, and the social norms, which mm. all of a sudden it was like, you know, I was getting made fun of for the same stuff that everyone was doing in, in elementary school. And suddenly it like wasn't cool anymore. Mm. And I just hadn't picked up. I hadn't learned these social norms, these behavioral norms. Mm. And, uh, so by the age of 13, I'd already contemplated suicide for quite some time. And fortunately I didn't do it. And, mm. and to anyone out there listening, know that it gets better and that you can uh -huh. seek help. And now I consider myself one of the happiest people on the planet. Mm. Um, but, <laughs> uh, I, I, I decided to stick around and I, I kind of decided that, and this, you know, it, it's easy speaking 20 years back to talk mm. about it and say like, I decided, but when I say I decided, I mean, over the course of five years, eight mm. years, I kind of decided like, well, I'm here and I'm not going anywhere and I don't like who I am. So I might as well become the person that I want to be. And at first that took the role of mm. accomplishments and achievement. And I started a business and I started making all kinds of money. And I realized like, I, I still don't really like myself. Other people seem to like me more because they know that I can do something. Entrepreneurship really saved my life because it taught me I can do something. Mm. And then I started asking, well, if I can do that, then what else can I do? Well, and it turns out I could succeed in school. I did have to be medicated to sit through the, uh, the, normal school system and be able to mm. sit still and do the reading in the books and all that, I had to be medicated just to get through mm. it. And then I yeah. went off the medication. Then I went back to grad school. I was like, nope, can't sit still this long. <laughs> I need to be medicated. But um, it, it, it put me on this journey of like, how, you know, who do I want to be? How mm. do I want to be? Yeah. And can I just learn those things? And I think the last 10 years of my life has really been a matter of every time I've wanted to change something or improve something about myself, I've approached it as a learning challenge. Mm. What do the people who are that way know and what do they do and how do I learn what they know? Mm. And this is whether, you know, starting my most recent business, I knew nothing about online courses, podcasts, books, <laughs> uh, leading remote teams. And I just learned it. Uh, whether it's in my personal life, I, I spent nine years being single didn't know what to do. I was like on my last legs. I, I was at that point where I was like, well, maybe I could like just have kids by myself. Maybe I, could <laughs> I was, I was getting to that point honestly. Yeah. And then I said, well, what if I treated this? Like I treat everything else in my life. Yeah. Like I had problems with my joints and knees and I just read a bunch of books on biomechanics and I fixed uh -huh. it. I was like, I've always assumed that this was not a learning challenge, that this was something I just need to wait for the right time and the right person to come. But what if I treated it as a learning challenge? That's fascinating because a lot of people feel the same way as what you're sharing. Yeah. I'm here to tell you for me, it was a learning challenge and I needed to unlearn a lot of old behaviors, patterns, and beliefs yeah. about who I was and what I was. And I, and I uncovered a lot of amazing stuff that I was like, holy crap, I've been carrying this around. Mm. And, and I needed to relearn new patterns of communication, of being vulnerable, but not too vulnerable. And uh, within about six months, I met my now wife. And, <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, and I'm in a happy, healthy, wonderful relationship, knock on wood. Uh, and I know I'd give people an, an amazing recommendation to accelerate because I read a lot of books and I, I talked to a lot of coaches. I even pulled Esther Perel aside at a conference one time <laughs> and asked her, a bunch of questions. So Esther, if you're out there, thank you. Um, there's a great book that will accelerate your process uh, of all this learning. It's like a crash course in being the right person for a healthy relationship. It's by um, Karen Woodward Thomas. It's called Calling in the One. Amazing. Ah, yeah. Amazing book. We saw her speak at Mind Valley. Um, yeah, she had a stage with her great. recently. She's uh, very She's down great. to earth as well. Really cool. I love, yeah, she was awesome. Just every lesson that you need, some that you don't, but who knows which ones are going to, are going to really, uh, mm -hmm. touch you. Yeah. And I've given out a lot. I, I, I order them in bulk now and I give them out to people <laughs> and I've been to two weddings that resulted from me handing yeah. <laughs> which is pretty cool. three, if That's you include awesome. my own. That's so. awesome. So let's use that as a, as a nice little segue to what mm -hmm. is the one skill that is above everything else. Like I, I love this. Yeah. The only skill that matters as the cover the of the only skill says. that matters. 
Yeah, it's it's learning. Um, Alvin Toffler in Future Shock, I think it was, said the the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who can't read, but those who can't learn, unlearn, and relearn. And mm. I believe that to be true um, because, look, there are a lot of skills that are important. Yep. Um, people skills, personal financial skills, academic skills, professional skills, uh, I would argue, argue physical skills are important, not as important as, uh, as are, or more important than people make them. Um, but in order to acquire those skills, you need to be able to learn. And that's why mm. if you have this skill of learning quickly and effectively, and you have that confidence to go out and learn whatever it is, that's kind of the only skill you need. Everything else comes from that. So I do know from your path as well that, you know, um, a lot of the stuff that, you know, is your own curiosity, um, I think let's, let's ask that question then, you know, like obviously there is, it, how do I put this without sounding like, I'm just going to say it the way I want to say it. Like it's very babushka dolly. <laughs> if I can use that as like a metaphor for you to go on to learn and then be fascinated by learning. And obviously on the inspired evolution, I'm very conscious of, you know, obviously our biggest gift to the world is often stemmed from our biggest challenge. And obviously, you know, yes. learning with something from like, you know, something that challenged you early on and that then formed like such an amazing blessing that you're sharing with thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people all across the world now. Now the question I've got in and around that is surely like, and now you touched on a few of them like entrepreneurialism and you know, like what, mm -hmm. what are the other things other than learning that really like get you to tick? Ah, oh, entrepreneurship. Yeah. I, uh, I've realized like I'm really passionate about creating and it took a long time for me to self-identify in that way because I think as a society, we, we, we kind of narrowly define creation. Mm. It's like artists, they're creating. And, um, and then everyone else, like we don't think of entrepreneurs as creators. We mm. think of them as leaders, no, no, no. at least where I grew <laughs> up, right? And it's like, well, no, you're actually, you're creating and you're building and you're making and you're, totally. you're helping others create products and services. And, and I've realized that that's what I'm really passionate about is creating new things. Mm. The, the most miserable times for me are when I have to focus on just the management and not creating new stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's like, the okay, systems. We've done this project <laughs> systems, and now we yeah. need to like get everything set up. I actually love creating systems. I love yeah. creating systems. Creating but systems. But, really, right, but just, just exactly. sitting there turning the handle <laughs> is quite a boring process. <laughs> am I so entrepreneurship <laughs> is like, uh, yeah. I, I would say entrepreneurship is really big and self-improvement. Uh, mm. I'm really big on fitness. I'm really big on nutrition. Um, I, I just, uh, I like, you know, there's people who like really love maintaining their car and they'll, they'll like polish and wax their antique car every mm. weekend. And I love just taking good care of my body. Like it, it feels to me like, like this, this process of love. Mm. Um, and I, you know, even though it's not always fun, like it's <laughs> not always fun to, to do a CrossFit workout and want to throw up. It's not always fun to do a cold shower, but I love this like exhilaration of being in my body and, and taking proper care of it. Because so many people don't, and, and you know who you are, you know, you treat your body as a vehicle for getting your brain from meeting to meeting. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's so much more, it's so mm. much more than that. Yeah. So in this thread, and I really feel this connection personally, um, entrepreneurialism, learning, um, and then personal development, you know, Mm -hmm. For me, fundamentally, um, of by faith, I'm a Sikh and a Sikh literally translates to learner. Um, so my faith is awesome. to learn, right? Um, mm -hmm. And our word for God is Waheguru, which means the teacher. So anything that is yeah. teaching you is God. And if you stop to pause, a blade of grass can teach you. And if you stop to pause, yeah. this conversation can inform me. And God is infused yes. into all the little moments of everything that brings this tapestry, the tapestry together, even the ability for me to have this conversation or to be able to cognitively put something together that can then inform a learning experience is spiritual yeah. for me. And hence the path of the learner in the, is this kind of reflected? Does that resonate quite deeply at your end in terms of? It does. I would also add, um, I went through some really intense experiences with, with psychedelics and, and realizing that, um, just the presence of the oneness and, and the fact that for all intents and purposes, 
you'll never know it is I'm going to get really weird and out there, but you'll never mm. know if you're God or not because mm. of the whole kind of cogito ergo sum, right? You mm. never know. It's the problem of other minds in philosophy, mm. they call it. And so you might be the God of your own universe. And therefore, uh, I love that. I love that component because I believe we're all teachers. Mm. Um, and, and I'll tell you a, a turning point for me was at Burning Man actually, where I went to a seminar on becoming a healer. Mm. And the first thing the guy said was like, how many of you believe that you're a healer? Almost no one raised their hand. And he said, but if you're injured, you heal. And everyone raised their hand. And he goes, so you have within you the energy mm. to heal right? You have within you the capacity to heal yourself. You just need to learn how to turn that outward. And I was like, oh my God, the same is true <laughs> of learning and teaching. How many people identify as teachers, mm. but, I, but we're all learners. I mean, if you're standing, oh. there, you're understanding the words coming out. So you taught yourself many, many, many things, yeah. right? So therefore you're a teacher. And if you're if you can teach yourself, then you can teach others. And so I believe, I believe it's our birthright to be learners and teachers in that same way. And I, I love this idea of, of, of God is the great teacher because there is God in all of us, right? Yeah. There's lessons everywhere. There's lessons it, everywhere. Right? <laughs> Absolutely, brother. I love that. And so for those that um, really want to tune into a little bit more about um, mm -hmm. you, I know there's... Um, there's many different ways. There's online courses. Um, I love yes. jle.vi is a great, is a great place yep. to just touch ground and see everything that's in there. And, um, you'll start to really understand what it looks like to live in the head of a polymath. <laughs> <laughs> totally fair. Totally fair. When you get there, it'll be like, Oh, I can do this and I can do this. I was like, okay, candy store. What can I, Oh wow. This is all amazing. Right. Interesting. So, uh, really a lot of respect and like, for the energy Thank that you. goes Thank into so creating much. so many amazing things as well, brother. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's an act of love. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, so it's, what's it's the act of love. And as you said, it comes from, uh, I don't think anyone would put in the time, the hours, the energy or the effort that I have, if it didn't come from a place of, of healing and, mm. and pain. <laughs> Very few people do this stuff because they've had a, a completely smooth journey. <laughs> Yeah. yeah the couch is pretty comfortable <laughs> right. yeah perfect and in terms of like takeaways so what are your top three takeaways if we want to really look after our heads our minds our yeah. learning abilities yeah. what is the key takeaways first and foremost learn how to use your memory uh, mm. we have tons of free resources on it you can check out my youtube channel there's a free five-day memory mastery course you can take we have this like free seven-day trial that people can take at superhuman school or superhumanacademy.com mm. slash squad. I'll send you links for the, and they can take our five day memory mastery and they will have a superhuman memory. So train your memory mm. because, um, you know, it, it, first off, it will benefit you in everything that you want to learn, whether that's yep. names, whether that's remembering important things, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So that's a big one. Uh, two is invest in your learning capacity overall, not just memory. Mm. Um, you know, there should be a method to the madness. You wouldn't go into the gym and just start randomly doing whatever looks right. You would have a plan mm. and you would say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to warm up. Yep. You know, I, I hope you would warm up and I hope you would cool down and you would drink water before you go to the gym and, and you do all these things. But when you sit down to learn, it's just like, all right, let me crack open a book and see what sticks. So that's the, the second one. Um, and I guess the third one is, is really invest time in learning because it's this great gift that we can do that no, no other species can do. And I would venture to guess that the people you most admire and wish to emulate in your life are some of the most prolific learners, whether mm. that's business people, whether that's musicians. I mean, I don't care if you're if your role model is Lady Gaga, most people don't realize she's an incredibly gifted musician and a mm. very avid learner. Mm. Um, and you know, wherever you want to be, the path is learning. Yeah. Whatever, wherever you are now and wherever you want to be, what stands in between is learning knowledge and an implementation of knowledge. That is such a profound statement. And you said it so clearly. Yeah. I love that. Thank you, brother. Look, I'm going to ask a, a couple of uh, questions just for myself personally that are very pertinent to where sure. I'm at in my life. And I'd love to sort of just drop in around that. Um, information overload. 
yeah. in today's world. You know, there was definitely a time when knowledge was power. And I definitely feel mm-hmm. like in today's day and age, dissemination of, poly, uh, of knowledge is more powerful than because we've, you know, the internet is almost like the second coming of Christ yeah. in terms of what it's revolutionized for the world. Right. Um, right. But in like, how do you cope with, you know, cause I know for myself, for someone that is consistently learning, like legitimately, um, pumping yeah. through, you know, sometimes two to three audio books a week, um, then learning yep, songs, yep, yep. learning music, like consistently engaged in the learning process. Um, it can, there, there is, uh, there, there can be overwhelm and I've had to learn yeah. different ways to navigate through that. Meditation is like my Bible. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but yeah, like how do you navigate through that? Yeah, I've got some good tips there. So people, I think, wrongly assume that because I can read seven, almost 800 words a minute, I just read everything in sight. And because I have this memory skill, I just devour everything. The truth is, I am selective about what I consume. So Mm -hmm. first, I try to get my information from books because I believe personally that if something is important enough or long lasting enough or big enough of a trend, someone will write a book about it. So I try not to get my information from blogs, magazines, things like that. Ironically, I I do podcasts and blog. Mm -hmm. I don't listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, And if I do, it's more for entertainment than for education. Mm. Uh, I also don't listen to a lot of audiobooks um, because I don't retain information as well via audio. Once in a while I will. Uh, but not books that I need to be able to retain. So I try to get most of my information from books. I try to stay away from news and blogs mm. too, too much unless something bubbles up to the top because I, yeah. I acknowledge that there are blogs that are super valuable. I, I have exceptions. So I read Wait But Why. Because mm. if someone... Oh, that's, spends, <laughs> that's not a blog. That's a piece of art. <laughs> exactly. So if someone spends six months researching something, it's worth me learning and, and understanding. Yeah, totally. Um, And then online courses, I also take a pretty good amount, but I'm selective uh, Mm. and I'm picky about what I consume. And then once I decide to consume something or learn something, then I choose my sources and I, you know, I'll read five books on a topic. I'll take an online course. I'll listen to podcasts and I'll absorb it. But, um, I'm selective and I'm deliberate about what I learn. Like I'll have a theme. Yeah. A couple of years ago, the theme was Russian. Then it was piano for that. It was acro yoga. So it's like, I'll focus on major learning challenges at once and devote mm. myself so that I'm not kind of pitter pattering around too much. Cool. So you line yourself up with an intention and sort of flow in that exactly. direction. I'm just very deliberate about it. Yeah. I love that. Perfect. Thank you for that. I think that's very really useful. And then, um, in terms of genuinely, like, I know, I know you've probably done more research in this space than I have. So I'm curious to find out like how to genuinely like upgrade your sleep in order to facilitate yeah. your brain and your learning cool. and your mind. We could do a whole podcast about this. <laughs> so I'll give you the high notes. I first have my work trackers so I know what I'm dealing with because uh, your, your experience of how you sleep is uh, extremely inaccurate. Mm. If I asked you how you sleep last night, I can't really rely on that information mm. uh, because you don't know how much REM you got versus how much of it was light sleep. You know, you, you only know to tell me how many times you woke up, yeah. which isn't really a good indication. Um, I don't think I'm going to surprise people too, too much with all this. Uh, don't eat three hours before bed, mm-hmm. no screens, three hours before bed, mm-hmm. orange glasses. If you need to be around unnatural light, try mm-hmm. not to expose yourself to too much light, cold sleeping environment, very comfy bed, quiet sleeping environment is very important. Uh, make sure that you're not magnesium deficient. That will cause a lot of sleep problems for you. Um, and do not keep your digital devices anywhere near the bed. I wouldn't even put them in the bedroom. Right. Um, the exception for me is the aura ring that stays on me during sleep. But besides that, uh, that's it. And making sure that you're getting enough physical activity and sunshine during the day, because that's, what's going to set your circadian rhythm. Yeah. So get out in the sun 15 minutes a day, expose yourself to sunlight, try to work near a window so that you're in tune with, with that circadian rhythm and, mm. uh, and exercise. So important. If you're not getting rigorous exercise, your body won't be tired. Mm, I love that. And for those tuning in, I just want to take a moment to, you know, when you're on this path of consistently learning, and I think you've referenced this quite a bit, the way you articulate it is much more polished the way than I do, but you've mentioned this a few times in bits of information, they get paired and you have those connections. Um, and this thing about circadian rhythms has definitely been a thing that, you know, I've been tuned into in terms of your eyes are just, these are, they're amazing. They're universal bits of, 
God knows only God could create such a thing. <laughs> um, Craziness. Yeah. Even this, Darwin said that. <laughs> Even Darwin was like, I have to admit, my theory of evolution kind of starts to break down with the eye. Yeah. But, it's uh, incredible. Oh, well. <laughs> incredible. And so, but this thing about like even speed reading, like just to bring it down to something, you know, on a bit more humane and like in your, in your world, but like speed reading, when you were referring to like when the circad, like your circadian cuts off, um, when you're actually shifting your focus of your eyes and in order Mm -hmm. to speed read, try and like maintain a focus in one spot and then take like widen the band of your focus to take it all in rather than when you're tracking, you're actually cutting out. Um, yeah, that was a really, you can't, uh, yeah, you can't make smooth motions with your eye unless you're tracking a moving object. Yeah. And most people make one saccade per word. Mm. And you spend a lot of time in saccadic blindness. You actually mm. want to try and widen those out. Now, you can never you can't make your eye your your fovea, the the mm. sharp area, you can't make it wider. But you can train your brain to pay more attention to things in the parafovea even though they're blurry. So you can learn to make two or three movements per line instead of the average person makes 8 to 12. Right. Um, and so it's just more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. I fascinated. So it's just all these things. dropping. Yeah. But it's, it's It's worth it. Yeah. Well, this is what you were saying as well. And after you read, you rest Mm -hmm. because you've consolidated. Yeah. You've been putting yourself, but like, even in terms of like hard, it's like going to the gym and having to work out. You don't just, you know, pick yourself up. Yeah. I can't speed read for five hours straight. (laughs) Not a chance. In short bursts and then I'm done. It's exhausting. Awesome. Absolutely. A question I've got, if we could erect a billboard Times Square, New York, and you had the opportunity for it to say something to the masses, um, what would your billboard read? It's a really, really tough, Mm -hmm. tough one. I'm tempted to say never stop learning, but I think on, on the global scale, there are more important things mm. like, uh, potentially be kind to one another, be mm. kind to this planet and to one another. I think that'll perfectly segue into my last question, which is, um, beyond the name, beyond the learning, who are you? Hmm. I think I'm just a curious kid, honestly. I'm a curious kid and I love to just get so excited about things, and passionate about them, and I want to share that excitement with others. I love that, brother. I feel such a kinship with you. It's so amazing. Likewise. I just I just want to take it like this little window of opportunity to thank you uh here and today um for giving your time, your energy and tuning all the way in from Israel and just back from your honeymoon. So My got you on the good Thanks end of the stick me. for sure. <laughs> and yes. um and not just today, brother, like you know, all the energy and the effort and the work that it takes, you know, like it is a journey. The inspired evolution is always a journey, and all the work you've put into yourself and you know, like to get yourself here today, just taking the massive acknowledgement to all of that just so we can have this informed conversation today yeah i appreciate uh, that and i appreciate everything you do (laughs) wishing you all the best brother thanks again all right my friend take care Thank you guys so much for tuning in to the Love of the Inspired Evolution and sharing the Love of the Inspired Evolution. If you feel like this content may support, has supported you or may support anyone else that you know may resonate with the content of it, please share away and share the love around. Thank you guys so much. And to stay up to date on whatever's coming out with the Inspired Evolution, please subscribe. There's all these links in the bio for you to tune into the episodes and all these different platforms just so that message can get to you and your loved ones. Thank you so much for all your love and support. Stay inspired. Tool of